everybody, Dave from Plan Acre Zero One. Myths and ancient legends often turn out to be true. Just a quick search on the internet, like in this, this Reddit thread, you can find out some many uh, once considered myths have turned out to be actual truth. The Trojan War, the city of Atlantis, King Arthur to a certain degree, the Amazonian warrior women, El Dorado, even the Kraken. There's some really interesting ones like the fires of Queenland, which you can read a lot about on the internet, and the uh, Hittites. So there's many, many once considered legends or tall tales or myths or fairy tales that have been proven true. So when we entered Basel in Switzerland, you're right away confronted with some very interesting legends and uh, tall tales, perhaps, that surround the city. They're all over the place and statues and monuments, yeah, literally all over the city. You see a lot of dragons, actually. And you see a lot of evidence for perhaps even giants. So where is the line between myth, fairy tale, and fact? It's hard to say, isn't it? It's very hard to say, but that's what I love about this topic is whether true or not, the fact is it's become part of our culture. It's plastered on the side of ancient churches. There's fountains all over the city in this instance in Basel with these little dragons, and they're has to be something about them that resonates with the history of the people. If nothing else, that's an important thing to take from this. It's a Rhine. That's a broad, broad river. They got more of these dragons. Oh, wow, there's a cool, uh, I guess the dragon must somehow be symbolized here from Basel. I don't know what the story about that is. Who slayed the dragons? Yet it remains are things like the basilisk, a crazy type of dragon figure, actually true? Was there actually such a creature that existed perhaps well before um, the stories are, are documented as being told? In this case, 1474, something that existed long before that, thousands of years before that, that the people just passed down through the oral history. Yeah, we don't know. But there's, because history is only so old, writing, printing is only so old. So it's very interesting to dive into these tales and to see the actual evidence of them literally all over the place, in this case in Basel. So hope you enjoy the video. And at the end of the video, I'm going to go over some other uh, legends in Switzerland. Only Switzerland has a lot of legends and uh, myths surrounding just that uh, beautiful country. So stay tuned to the end for that. Now we're going to check out Basel and some of the interesting dragons and giants that can be spotted all around. That fella. Why is it sticking out his tongue? Do one drink here? Just building. with their uh, water fountains with these weird dudes. <laughs> do, do you know who that is, the, uh, the knight? Uh, no, I don't know the, the name. I don't know. I don't know. I, I only know he killed the basilisk. The, the, the dragon? Yeah, the dragon, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then you want to see a big one of this one? You go here, it's straight uh, 500 meters, and then before you, you go to the bridge, you have on the right side. Mm -hmm. When was this church built? 1019. 1019. And before that, it had other. Yes, there was routes. already a, a church here from 800. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. I think I found out who uh, killed the dragon. It's right up here. I mean, to a certain large degree. The 
this fella right here. Whoever that fella is. And he's got a, a helmet of uh, flames coming down with angels. make this clear there's not much information in English this is uh, in German and uh, basically translated it into uh, English so it's the three um, so Jockey Fountain or Brunnen its translation of what it's uh, the name of the statue or this this work was the three or three ages of life so many of his works can be seen in public spaces in Basel for instance the corner of Abergrand and Bufus Strasse near the art museum. This is one we we're seeing now. Fountain sculpture, the three ages of life. It's completed in 1955. It received the art prize of the city of Basel. There are some fountains in Basel that no one knows who created or designed them in order to prevent forgetting the name of the creator. This fountain was named after its creator. There are three gargoyles on the edge of the fountain. In the middle, there is a bronze bowl in which several invisible gargoyles are attached, on which an iron base stands. It has numerous animal and human figures with water spraying from their mouths. On the base, there are three male figures from different periods of life. The young man looks out into the vastness of the world on the Rhine. The one who plays the flute and looks a bit dreamy into the world is considered to be at the age of puberty. The third man the giant is an old man. More information right there. So that's just amazing. I mean, that that is no normal old man right there. I just want to cut in here to show some of the details of the of the base of the fountain, which I didn't have time to zoom in on because we were late for a match. But if we go here to this PDF, um, and here's all the information on the PDF and what have you. So there we see, you see that the man, I mean, his, 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 just a half of his leg is as big as the whole grown man's leg. So this is supposed to be the old guy. This is the, the, the father and the sons behind here. So, you know, this is a full grown man here. This old man, so-called old man, look how uh, speared he is, how many his muscles. And look at just half of his leg from his knee below is as big as this man's whole leg. Um, but look underneath. That's what I, you know, wanted to get into. Uh, and he's sort of gesturing down to it, like, look here, check this out. Um, and there's the boy playing the flute. But there's some, there's a lot of stuff going on down here. And I don't have time to try to decipher it. But uh, we see people on bicycles. We see uh, oddball, you know, uh, masked figures. Uh, with with goats, we see people having fun. We see people. I don't know if that's fun or or not. <laughs> um, there's just a lot going on down here, which is hard to to decipher really quickly. But that's just so you know. That's at the base of the of the fountain. Just wanted to point that out. I just uh, lightened up the one halfway decent picture I had in Photoshop. It was. Yeah, it was a bad picture. But anyway, check this out. I didn't see this mentioned anywhere. Look at, if you zoom in on, once again, look how huge his leg is as big as the half the man. But anyway, uh, if you zoom in here, you see 
There's uh, his uh, name, 35 to 42. But what do you see right there? <laughs> it's a turtle. And, and a turtle is a, a very typical uh, symbol uh, in the Bible for the Mayans, having to do with the foundation of, of, of the earth. Underneath here, you see some interesting things. You see like a, a wall or a blind or someone coming from behind it. But there is also some weird things going on. This looks almost like legs and a head, like someone's upside down. So it's like a little person or a monkey on somebody. Uh, that one was that that mask type figure with some with the goat. I wish I had more time to examine this when I was there. And you got some other, you know, obviously uh, things going on, and it's just amazing. And underneath here are the gargoyles, which you can't see. You can't make this stuff up. Only thanks to God. I mean, I always knew gargoyles, which you read in the German description. There's three gargoyles on, underneath the base holding it up and some invisible gargoyles. Somehow, I don't know how they're how you see them if they're invisible. Nonetheless, I always knew gargoyles. They're all over ancient churches and cathedrals. And they, uh, you know, they have, they have a function to uh, protect water running off the building. But get this, gargoyles were also intended to symbolize guardianship of the building or the statue perhaps in this case and to ward off evil spirits their open mouths were symbolic of them devouring giants let that sink in but this turtle they see on christian faith guide uh, what does a turtle symbolize a turtle is seen as a symbol of wisdom Resilience, patience, and virtue. The calm, docile, steadfast nature of these animals is a reason behind the symbolism, as well, their, as well as their long lifespans, which make them a purple example of resilience. Some interesting other points they make. Uh, the patterns, matter of fact, I think I got my... Uh, I have this right here. So this is from uh, the Mayans, and they were very big on the pattern. And if you count it, it'll come out to 13. And 13 is a very important number. So, uh, you know, 13 compartments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, at least on this side. So uh, and that's the significance 13 in, in the Mayan uh, culture and belief system. So, um, but in Christianity, you'll see it many times in churches and in different books. As a matter of fact, I think it's even in my little Bible up there. But the, sh the shell of a turtle is a highly protective barrier between the animal and the outside world. It's covered by intricate patterns that have long been reg regarded as markings of spiritual past between this world and the next. According to these studies, a link can be found between constellations and the shell on the turtle's backs. The arced shell represents the firmament, Genesis 1, 6 through 8, and the body underneath is the flat earth it is taken as a symbol of how earth sorry of how heaven and earth are linked and heaven is above earth just as the shell is on top of the turtle's body a young man we have a man and over here we have a giant i mean that's a giant if I ever saw one. I don't know exactly what. That's a real giant. Working away. So there you have it. Isn't it just amazing? There's so much just right in front of our eyes that 
begs to be questioned, was it once true? Were there once dragons that roamed the earth? There's many legends and tales about this. Even the Bible talks about dragons, of course, and of course about dinosaurs and about giants. So who knows? But it's interesting to see it right there out there resonating still to this day in our culture and our societies. Whether true or not, it plays a part in our culture and our history. Now let's check out some of these ancient Swiss legends that, who knows? We already covered a basilisk. It's a mystical creature that date back, dates back as far as the 1400s. I would, I would wager to bet it dates back way further than that if they're talking about these things. In 1619, a chronicle narrates the story of a man's sight of these dragons in a giant rock in a mound called Pilatus towards another cave known as Flu. Another story from the summer of 1421 talks of a gigantic, a gigantic, not little dragons, but a gigantic dragon that flew to the mountain and crashed to the ground so close that one of the farmers nearby named Stevflin fainted in shock when he became conscious. He found a lump of blood and the stone of the dragon which was then declared to have healing powers. And here's a link to that uh, source. So these are very interesting. When we see on the church there, this is, this is clearly a legend that's being passed down for a reason. You know, the church just doesn't put things on the side of the building, which are, uh, you know, fairy tale. You know, there's enough faith required for many people to, to accept Jesus. Now, I, I accept them out of faith, not a problem, but I know some have problems with that. So they're not going to put things on the side of the wall that are going to give people more reason to question the validity of what they're preaching inside of the church building. So that would make me believe this was something that people fully embraced and understood. Whether it was true or not, that's still another story, but the likelihood of it being true in my mind would be more likely so than not to have it there on the side of the church, the most important building in town for hundreds and hundreds of years. So uh, the giant gargantuan of Matterhorn, Matterhorn is a huge pith pinnacle point on the, on, in the Alps. Uh, Swiss Alpine folk tales would not be with their legendary giants of the country's Alps. So many giant uh, tales out in the Alps. One of the most famous giants among Switzerland top attractions and consequently, highest, and consequently one of its highest mountains, the legendary, the legend behind him involves a giant called Gargantua, whom the stories recollect as the one who left a mark through his footsteps on the gorgeous landscapes across the country. It's a very interesting read about him. Uh, the Tazel Vorm, also known as Stolen Vorm or Spring Vorm, is a mystical creature from Swiss and German Alpine folklore. It's often described as a serpent-like creature with a cat-like head, oh man, and is feared for its venomous breath or bite. Sightings and tales of Tazelvorm date back centuries, said to be real and even photographed. So, uh, you know, check out that one. That's really amazing. St. George and the Dragon, according to Golden Legend, we saw this one and we're seeing this one, the video right here. The narrative episode of St. George and a dragon took place in a place called Silence in Libya. The golden legend is the first to place this legend in Libya as a sufficiently exotic locale where a dragon might be imagined. In the 10th century Georgian narrative, this place is the fictional city of Lazia and is the godless emperor who is Salinas. St. George by chance rode past the lake. The story continues in the, the uh, web addresses here. St. George by chance rode past the lake. The princess trembling sought to send him away, but George vowed to remain. The dragon reared up out of the lake while they were conversing. St. George fortified himself with the sign of the cross, charged in on horseback and with his lance and gave it a grievous wound. Then he called the princess to throw him her girdle, and he put it around the dragon's neck. When she did so, the dragon followed the girl like a meek beast on a leash. She and St. George led the dragon back to the city of silence, where it terrified the people at its approach. But St. George called to them, saying that if they consented 
to become Christians and to be baptized, he would slay the dragon before them. The king and the people of silence converted to Christianity. George slew the dragon, and the body was carted out of the city on four ox carts. 15,000 men baptized without women and children. That's a quote. On the site where the dragon died, the king built a church to the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. George. And from its altar, a spring arose whose waters cured all disease. The equestrian statue is located below the George Strom George Tower and depicts Knight George fighting against a remarkably small dragon. The statue dates from 1372 and is made of redstone that we can see. So uh, the dragon in the myth is a lot bigger than what we saw. You know, the dragons around town are these little guys, the Basilix, you know, so they might have sort of uh, just used one of those. The dragon that uh, St. George slayed uh, had to be dragged out on four carts. So that was, a, you know, obviously a, a sizable um, beast. Mountain giants are primordial giants that live in caves and are big and strong. Legends of Switzerland include historic and semi-mythical people. So yeah, that's semi-mythical, there you go. Frost giants inhabit the peaks of the Alps, ruled by the Frost King. Mountain giants, just red. If we had uh, Gargantua, old Gargi is their king and Bertha is their daughter. Hotop is the giant who enjoyed eating humans. Well, stay away from him. And his friend uh, Schop was personification of alcoholic beverages, similar to John Ballycorn, especially destructive consequence of overconsumption. Hotop was unable to resist his partner's influence, eventually drank himself to death. Well, you know, interesting. These legends, have, you know, come to an end. Dragon serpentine monsters often have wings and breathing fire. One such tale involved a copper who drunkenly stumbled into a cave where he encountered a pair of these creatures. These dragons were unusual that they were friendly and allowed the copper to stay with them through the winter. However, when he returned home in the spring, he found that he was so used to eating dragon food that he could no longer stomach the human fare and eventually starved to death. Dragonette, little dragon tales, originated in Switzerland during the Middle Ages. So that's like this, uh, these, uh, creatures we see in Basel. So very interesting one that uh, someone actually met some dragons. Before the gray days, there was a huge giant, Samatis or Santis. His bed was the Schachwedenbach Valley and the Megalesop with its velvety alpine grass and its floral pillow. So there's the link for that one. So there's just a ton of these legends out there. There's just a ton of these legends out there and it's very interesting how uh, they seem to tie together, even with this little visit to Basel, but uh, in so much more. So once again, it speaks of giants in the Bible. I'll end with that right there in Genesis. And you can start there and then go look through the Bible, how many times giants are mentioned. And it's very, very interesting. And for that matter, also dragons. So take it for what it's worth. Myth, fairy tale, legend, or fact, or a combination of all, you decide. All right, buddy, take care. David from Pinecker Zero One wishing you a fantastic day. God bless you. Genesis 6. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown, like, you know, legends. Amazing.